Nihilism is the belief that life is meaningless. Unfortunately, even Muslims may suffer from some nihilistic feelings or tendencies. If they perhaps intellectually accept Islam, but emotionally they feel like their lives are simply pointless. It could be the case. And when somebody feels these overwhelming, depressing, nihilistic thoughts that it's all for nothing, it's usually not because of some choice that they made. It's more like a sickness that you've contracted and they don't know where it came from. You just don't know, why do I feel this way? How can I get rid of it? So what makes this so alarming in addition to all this is the number of people suffering from nihilism seems to be on the rise. It seems to be getting worse and worse. And the question is why? Well, there's a number of possible reasons, hypotheses. It's a multifactorial issue. Number one could be deceitful leadership. When people lose trust in their politicians, in even their teachers, in their religious clergy, in their doctors, and in their experts, even the mechanics, subhanAllah, then they feel this burden to research everything for themselves because nobody can be trusted. And what does that lead to? It leads to a sense of information overload. There's too much to learn. There's too much to look into and research. Have you heard this? Have you heard, I heard this, I heard that. On the news, every issue that pops up, there's a hundred different opinions and hours of research that needs to be done. And then the news cycle continues the next day, another issue that needs tons of research. You just feel like it's overwhelming, both on the public scale and even on the private scale. There's too much information. And the problem is amplified when you have echo chambers, information bubbles. People are more divided than ever because for the past 20 something years, you find that news feeds are catering to our biases, our various biases. And so as a result of that, you have these little groups that have the same type of thinking and they can't even barely communicate with other people because there's almost nothing in common. This makes a person feel like, what's even the point? Even worse, is that a very popular notion is that we're living in a post-truth world. Meaning what? That truth is subjective, it's all about post-modernism. You know, what you believe is your subjective truth and I have my own subjective truth. This makes people feel insane. How can truth be subjective? You know, this is my truth versus yours. It makes a person feel completely lost. And again, to make matters worse, some people feel like connecting to another person is impossible because words simply fail to communicate your subjective experience. How can I tell somebody what I feel with my words? I don't feel like I'm capable. I, they, I, they, you can't know what's going on inside of me. And this is only getting worse because smartphones, we have a generation of youth that are being raised on these things that are making them worse and worse at communication, which only makes them feel increasingly isolated, unfortunately. And plus, subhanAllah, we're living in times of incredible uncertainty. I mean, think about for a second, the way history has gone, typically what you find is what? Throughout history, that you'd have a farmer, he'd raise some children, teach them how to farm, that's their profession, now they know what they're going to do, they have the tools necessary to survive. Parents would traditionally pass down whatever trade they have, and they'd pass down the trade and their name. This is the Baker family, because they teach their kids how to bake. This is the Smith family, they're all a bunch of blacksmiths, etc., etc. This was the way things were for pretty much all of recorded human history, subhanAllah. And nowadays with rapid te technological advancements, you don't know if your scholastic degree is going to be relevant after the three years it takes to graduate. SubhanAllah, you're getting a degree, it could be the case that the moment you get your diploma, it's useless. So how exactly can your parents prepare you for this world if subhanAllah things are changing so rapidly. And when it comes to technology, another scary reality is the fact that we make technological advancements without being sure if they're actually good for society or not. New technological advancements, let's introduce it to society, let's create this, I don't know, new device. Do we know the impact it's going to have? What type of ramifications it'll have? Before we even know what we're dealing with, subhanAllah, it's already popularized. Furthermore, this sense of alienation, this sense of, I don't even know my own neighbors. This is something very new in human history. The idea that I'm so isolated and involved in my own devices that I don't even know my own kids. I don't talk to my own siblings. This is a brand new phenomenon. And again, it only increases this nihilism, this sense of everything's meaningless. I have no connection to people. Nothing makes sense. Everybody's in their own bubble. Nobody understands, we can't even communicate. 
Many people feel like life is just a game. I'm sure there are many young kids here who know what it's like. You play a video game, your character gets stronger, you collect all the coins, you make a lot of money in the game, of course, and then moments later, what? You turn off, you shut down the console, and you just realize, oh my God, all of that progress, all that skill, all that adventure, all that feeling of success now turns into regret because you realize it was useless. It has no real world application. It doesn't mean anything that I was a level this, that, that I got so many coins or I developed my character, made him strong and fast and whatever else. It's meaningless. Then some people, that's the way they look at life. They say, wait a second. So I'm gonna go through this life and get some sort of a degree, level up, make some money, put in the bank. What's it all for? If I'm going to die at the end of it, and that's like just turning off the console, then that means that the whole game was useless anyhow. What exactly am I chasing? And this deep sense of nihilism settles in, and they feel like, why should I try at anything at all? And like I said, the result of this, we can see it. We can see how it is increasing depression and even suicide. SubhanAllah, there are more than 700,000 suicides a year worldwide. I want you to think about, for a second, if anybody saw the image of the Super Bowl, right? That had 68,000 people in attendance, okay? Think about that gigantic crowd of people watching the Super Bowl and take that number and multiply it by more than 10, a little bit more than 10. That's how many people take their lives every year, subhanAllah. And keep in mind that that's how many people were successful, which means that statistically they say that for every successful suicide, there were 20 attempts, 20 attempts that were unsuccessful. So then take that number and multiply it again. That's how many people were tried to take their life. Are we starting to get the idea of just how bad it is when you really feel like there's no point to go on? There is no point to this life. And even those who don't want to take their own lives, you find, and I've spoken about this before in a previous khutbah, this concept of antinatalism, this concept of what? I don't want to have kids. I don't see a reason. I might not take my own life, but I don't see a reason to propagate life into the future. The term for it is DINK. D-I-N-K stands for dual income, no kids. In other words, you know, we're married, we have a relationship, we want a dual income, but we're not going to have any children. This is becoming more and more popular. And subhanAllah, like we said, this is on the increase. Between the year 2000 and 2021, suicide increased by 36%. That's a huge increase in the past 20 years. It's a huge increase. A suicide takes place in the United States every 11 minutes. So yes, it could be somebody that you know. Now, not to make everybody depressed, I'm saying this for a reason. The reason I mention all this is what? Because I think most Muslims don't talk about their Islam because they can't relate to this. Most Muslims don't see the world this way. Each day you wake up, I wake up, and our day revolves around Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You wake up with salah, you wake up with your wudu, you pray, you make your dua, adhkar. Your life revolves around Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You feel like everything is solid. Your life makes sense. And you live your life this way, and so if you've been doing this for all of your life, or the vast majority of your life, it's very difficult for you to relate to somebody who feels like they are just completely lost at sea. Nothing makes sense. There's no up, down, left, right, and it's all for nothing. And unfortunately, the problem is that we look at people who are, let's say, disbelievers, and we see their successes, whether it be academic success, financial success. They're taking pictures and smiling, and they look good. You know, great lighting and good hair and, I don't know, makeup and whatever the case is. And everything looks like these people are doing all right. And then we think of ourselves as having something beautiful. Islam is something beautiful. Islam is something convincing. It's something very intelligent and impressive and very powerful. Something that would be a nice addition to this person's life. They're doing okay, but Islam would be even better for them. But I doubt that most of us think of Islam as life-saving. I doubt that most of us think of Islam as life-saving. We don't think of it in those terms, and yet we should. We need to realize that when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sends revelation and sends a statement as powerful as, وَمَا خَلَقْتُ الْجِنَّ وَالْإِنسَ إِلَّا لِيَعْبُدُونَ I have not created jinn or man except to worship me. This is not just a powerful philosophical position, an intelligent argument. This is not just powerful words. They're beautiful, they're inspiring. SubhanAllah, brothers and sisters, it's life-saving. 
because you're telling somebody you actually exist for a reason. This is our job, to save lives by letting people know it's not just a video game. You're not just collecting coins and then eventually when you turn off the console, it's all over. Just wasting your time running around and then eventually it all gets deleted. It's not just a waste of time. You have to explain that our Creator, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has said, وَمَا خَلَقْنَا السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضَ وَمَا بَيْنَهُمَا لَاعِبِينَ مَا, خلقنا ما, ما خلقناهما إِلَّا بِالْحَقِّ وَلَكِنَّ أَكْثَرُهُمْ لَا يَعْلَمُونَ Allah Ta'ala has said to us and revealed to us, we did not create the heavens and the earth and what is between them in play, لَاعِبِينَ in jest. It's not just one big game, it's not a joke. Allah Ta'ala is specifically addressing this mentality. You think it was all for nothing? No. We did not create them except بِالْحَقِّ with truth, with a purpose. There is an objective here, there's something greater, but most of them don't know. That's the problem. We know, but most people don't know. And we just don't feel the pressure or the need because we've never really experienced that emptiness. Every time you get up and you make your takbir and put your head to the ground, you are becoming what? Grounded, subhanAllah, both in the metaphorical, the figurative and the literal sense. You are grounding yourself, you're grounding your reality. And I don't think most of us have the capacity to put ourselves in those shoes where nothing means anything. There's a very beautiful quote by Viktor Frankl, who was a very famous author. He wrote a book after suffering underneath the Nazi uh, occupation, and he, he, there was a big question as to why should I even live? Am I just living to suffer? And yet he found a purpose and a reason to keep going. And so one quote that he says is what? Suffering ceases to be suffering the moment it finds a meaning. SubhanAllah, what a powerful quote. Think about that, that my suffering, so long as my suffering has meaning, then my suffering isn't suffering at all. This is such a powerful notion because life indeed does have meaning. Just hurting for no reason is depressing. If you are suffering for no reason and your pain is meaningless, then of course you're going to wonder, why do I keep persisting? Why should I keep going through this? Maybe I should just end it all. However. When you hurt for the sake of exercise, when you hurt for the sake of surgery, or when you hurt for any sort of cause that you truly believe in, it's no longer ridiculous, meaningless, depressing, rather it's noble. And you feel proud about yourself. And we all know this, you come back from the gym, you come back from the doctor, there's hope, there's reason. Yes, it might hurt when you suffer for your family. When you suffer for the cause that you believe in, you're happy that you've been through something that actually has meaning. The Prophet tells us what? Ya Mu'adh. Speaking to Mu'adh bin Jabal, he said what? Atadri ma haqqullahi ala al-ibad. Do you know what Allah's right is upon his slave? And he said, Allah wa rasuluhu alam. Allah and his messenger know best. And he said, an ya'buduhu wa la yushriku bihi shay'an. That he worships him alone and does not join any partners with him. And then he followed up with the next question. He asked, Atadri ma haquhum alayh, and subhanAllah, how beautiful and how wonderful that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the creator of the heavens and the earth, actually gave us rights over him. Allah ta'ala doesn't have to do that. There's no need for that. It's not necessary that Allah would give us rights over him. And yet he says, Do you know what the slave's rights are over his Lord? And subhanAllah, he says, Allah wa Rasulu Alam. No, I don't. Allah and his messenger know best. And he responded and said, what? That he does not punish them. SubhanAllah, so long as you believe in Allah, so long as you believe in Allah and know that you worship him and him alone, then the response is what? I will not punish you. Therefore what? You might say, I am going through suffering though. Sometimes I go through difficulty. Alhamdulillah, you can remember the words of the Prophet وسلم, that clarify. ما يصيب المسلم من نصب ولا وصب ولا هم ولا حزن ولا أذن ولا غم حتى الشوكة يشاكها إلا كفر الله بها من خطاياه That no fatigue, no disease, nor sorrow, nor sadness, nor hurt, nor disease is going to befall a Muslim even if it were the prick of a thorn. None of it is going to happen except what? Except that Allah expiates some of his sins. Meaning what? All of your suffering is not meaningless. All of it is improving you. All of it 
has a greater purpose. All of it will remove your evil, will elevate your status before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This entire test has meaning. If you can be patient and persist, whatever suffering you go through, you will be rewarded. What an important message that people need to know. You are not just an accident, suffering needlessly, foolishly, waiting to be put out of your misery. No, your purpose is much greater than that. And your reward is great with Allah if you so choose to worship Him. Again, my suffering, if it has meaning, then my suffering isn't suffering at all. SubhanAllah. And inshallah, we'll continue in the second khutbah. Wa sallallahu alayhi wa Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sallam Bismillah. Bismillah wa alhamdulillah wa salatu wa salam ala rasulillah. So it is our job to let people know that they have a purpose, that they should not be nihilistic and think that it's all meaningless. The disbeliever may ask, if God exists, if that's true, why hasn't he made himself obvious to me? Why doesn't he just show himself to me, guide my heart? Why? There's a number of possible answers that we could give. We could say, is it possible that God is waiting for you to have the correct motives to believe in him? Because it could be the case that, oh, my motive is just so I can have my prayers answered. I can just make dua and get whatever I want. Is that the correct motive? Or should you want to know the truth? Should you want to be grateful? So that's one possibility. You can also ask them, is it possible that God is respecting your moral autonomy by waiting for you to freely believe instead of forcing you? Is that possible? Okay, I never considered that. Is it possible that God is allowing your intensity of desire for him to develop further? Is it possible that the time has not come yet where you are serious enough, you need some more growth and development until you have that dedication. And furthermore, as a Muslim, it's our job to help those who disbelieve understand and consider certain options, certain ideas, certain possibilities. Because most people would say what? If the truth is presented to me, I know I'd accept it, no problem. We have to place the question to them. Have you ever considered that perhaps maybe your heart and your mind aren't receptive to the truth? Is it possible? that you've corrupted your faculties and therefore diminished your receptivity to the truth. Now, the disbeliever may say, well, how did I do that? Why? Why would that be the case? And you say, well, I'm glad you asked. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent revelation. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has told us that if you are somebody who commits injustice and oppression, then Allah says, Inna Allah la yahdi al zalimin. Allah does not guide the people of wrongdoing and oppression. Is there something that you've done wrong that is blocking you, preventing you, holding you back from guidance that you need to repent for? Are you the type of person that lies in his daily life or denies the blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, of God Almighty? Inna Allah la yahdi man huwa kathibun kafar. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, he does not guide those who are liars and perpetual deniers. People who reject and deny his blessings. If this is your quality, is this the thing that's holding you back? People just think, oh no, if I find the truth, I'll just accept it because I'm so receptive to the truth and so rational. No, there are ways that you cover your heart with rust and that rust eventually blocks out the light of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You need to polish that heart so that you can become receptive. It's not just the one who's sending, it's also the one who's receiving. Are you sure you're in that state? Have you committed zun, oppression, injustice? Have you been lying or living in denial? What about being wasteful? Inna Allah la yahdi man huwa musrifun kathab. Indeed, Allah does not guide the one who is wasteful and a transgressor and a liar. Maybe you need to improve yourself to become more receptive. Maybe there's certain wickedness. Maybe there's certain evils that you enjoy. You don't even feel bad about it. You like to be open about it. You like to flaunt your evil. You post it online for the world to see. Wallahu la yahdi al-qawm al-fasiqeen. And Allah does not guide the people who are defiantly disobedient. Yes, we all have disobedience. We all make mistakes, but hopefully we're ashamed of it. We cover it. We repent for it. We try to do better. But what about the one who is just open, blatant, enjoys it? Is this person going to be receptive to guidance? Allah is saying, no, I don't guide people like that. So you may be feeling this nihilism, this depression, this sadness. Why is God not guiding me? And I'm telling you, there's some work you need to be doing on yourself. What about your company? We know the Prophet says what? A man is upon the religion of his friend. So be careful and be cautious of who you befriend. If you're in evil company and you refuse to change to a better environment and you're like, I don't know why I can't be guided. I don't know why my heart is so depressed and sad and nihilistic. I don't know what's wrong with me. Are you making the necessary changes and improvements in terms of your company? What about arrogance? 
How will you be guided to the truth if you look down on the person who has that guidance? Oh, I would take guidance from them, but they're not from my country, my color, my race, my this, my that. He's got an accent. I don't like this. The Prophet says what? Al-kibru batarul haq wa ghamtun nas. Pride is disdain of the truth and contempt for people. You have contempt. You look down on people. And so when they tell you the truth, I won't accept the truth from you. You could say something so obvious. One plus one is two. Yeah, but no, I'm not going to hear it from you. No, 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 not from you. I won't hear it. Maybe from somebody else. I don't like your face or whatever the case is. Arrogant. Subhanallah. Maybe you're just straight up unworthy. Do we ever think about this? Do we ever think that we need to develop the goodness within us so that we are receptive to the truth? Do we ever think, do you ever take a moment to really think about the fact that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala could have chosen anybody for guidance? In the sense that the Prophet received this message from Jibreel alayhi salam. He is al-Mustafa, al-Mujtaba, al-Mukhtar, the chosen one. Do you ever take a second to say, why wasn't I chosen? Why didn't a messenger come to me? Was I not good enough? Is there something I need to be working on? I'm not saying any of us are going to become prophets, but maybe more guidance would come. Maybe more truth would come. Maybe I would get closer to this deen. What is holding me back from being the chosen one? From being chosen amongst the believers? Allah SWT says, وَلَوْ عَلِمَ اللَّهُ فِيهِمْ خَيْرًا لَأَسْمَعَهُمْ Had Allah known any good in them, He would have made them here. Speaking about these disbelievers. If Allah knew that there was some good in you, don't worry, I would have made you here. I would have conveyed that to you. It's a very interesting ayah. Somebody might say, well, but I'm not doing any of these evil things. I don't resist guidance. Okay, you don't resist it, but do you seek it out? Being neutral isn't enough. Have you ever prayed? Why do you assume that God would want to guide someone just because they're non-resistant to faith? Being neutral isn't sufficient. Let's ask you in your personal life. Do you personally want to love every person who doesn't hate you? No, it doesn't work like that. Just because you don't hate me doesn't mean I want to love you. It doesn't work like that. So, the reason is why. Because the person may not hate me, but they could be ambivalent, apathetic, neutral, which is no reason to love somebody. Neutral isn't enough. You must try to understand. Have you made the effort? Have you prayed? Have you repented? Have you tried to change your lifestyle? Have you tried to rid yourself of all the evils that may be covering your heart? You need, as Muslims, it's our job to get out there, to have these conversations with people, to get them to turn back and repent so that guidance will come into their hearts, so that they will actually dedicate themselves to learning, researching, and understanding. How can you be patient over something that you don't have any encompassing knowledge of? You don't understand something, how will you be patient over it? It's not going to work that way. So, in conclusion, we may not see it, but many people are suffering in silence. And we need to let them know. We can't be shy about this. We need to let them know. As we're watching these statistics go up, 36% in the past 20 years. Guys, this is not a joke. This is really bad in terms of how many people just can't take living anymore. They have no meaning. They see no hope, no light at the end of the tunnel because they think all these religious people, they're just a bunch of liars and con artists. They see the same thing in politicians. They see the same thing in every specialist. They're just out to get you. The degrees are all fake. They think everybody has their own. I have my own truth and it's just madness. Too much information. I don't know what to keep. I can't take this anymore. This is a very scary situation and we need to be those who tell them. Allah is the one who chooses for himself who he wills and he guides to himself whoever turns back to him. You make tawbah, you repent, you turn back to your Lord, Allah Ta'ala is going to guide you. Repent to your Lord, repent for the sins that you have done. We need to convey this message to others. May Allah Ta'ala make us of those who teach people the beauty of repentance. May Allah Ta'ala make us of those who open people's hearts to the beauty of Islam. May Allah Ta'ala make us of those who are teachers who bring this light in a sea of darkness. May Allah Ta'ala make us of those who can open people's hearts and give them a purpose to live. May Allah Ta'ala make us understand that this deen of Islam is not just something beautiful, powerful, intelligent, inspiring. SubhanAllah, it is more than that. It is life-saving. Ameen ya Rabbil Alameen. اللهم اهدنا في من هديت وعافنا في من عافيت وتولنا في من توليت وبارك لنا فيما أعطيت وقنا شر ما قضيت فإنك تقضي ولا يقضى عليك إنه لا يذل من واليت ولا يعز من عديت باركت ربنا وتعاليت ربنا آتنا في الدنيا حسنة وفي الآخرة حسنة وقنا عذاب النار وصلى الله على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم سمي كثيرا وأقم الصلاة